invite Director Cagle to come up and be part of this Q&A. And, &A. and uh, again, if you have questions, raise your hand. I, I'm finding not a lot of overlap in these questions. So uh, I'm going to start with a couple of uh, this up here. I'm going to start with a couple about the specifics of the report. Um, one, and this comes from Tricia Singh of the Asian American Peace Officers of Georgia. And where are you? Okay, you want to stand up? Um, so the question is... <laughs> by race, ethnicity, and if, if not, or is it possible to access this information? Yes, we, we have additional um, data that we can um, uh, cut the data with, uh, and I'm, uh, I'm told that we may already be doing some of that. And then, real specifically, since it does compare to the previous year, um, and this is from uh, Devin Fahaley from WXIA. Feely. Feely. Okay. Um, overall child deaths increased 18.4% in 2013. To what do you attribute this alarming increase? What immediate steps are being taken to reverse the troubling trend? Um, and then he noted himself in looking at the report that homicide was up 18%. I would, uh, I would first caution that um, this uh, data is improved, collected, the collection of are improved year over year. And so the, and it is, uh, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't draw the conclusion that there was that exact percentage in the increase. However, looking at the data, uh, homicides are most definitely a, a major concern to us. Working more closely with law enforcement and also training uh, our staff in better uh, evidence collection methods. Uh, hopefully, that would uh, aid us in preventing uh, those deaths. Now, I think the other thing that needs to be said in this forum is that it is a major mistake to jump to the conclusion that because a report comes to defects, that we have the ability to prevent the death ultimately. This is a very complex problem. Unfortunately, we cannot be present at all times. Our role is really about the reduction of risk and providing interventions that can um, bring these numbers down in the end game. So uh, I would caution against making broad uh, conclusions about this. Uh, these are indicators that point us in the direction of other efforts that may assist. And just one follow-up question to that. In looking at the report, it seems that the overwhelming majority of homicides occur within basically a year of DFAC's last contact with the family. Does that not indicate that perhaps some warning signs are being missed or that the agency is not properly assessing the danger that these children are in? Again, I think it would be a mistake to make that broad a conclusion. I think in looking at these, and since I've been here, I've looked at each and every death that has occurred to a child, um, I can tell you that the range that um, Ashley mentioned earlier that the Office of the Child Advocate sees is truly present. Um, you see casework that is top notch, and you see casework that really could use some improvement. Uh, so I think we try to take these cases as an instructive uh, look at the practice and uh, try to design training that will assist caseworkers in general in doing better assessment of people. That is always a challenge. But respectfully, if, if the... But, yeah, I mean, if we, can't, the we can't. But I, I mean, I don't feel that my question was answered. Okay, and I would also ask if somebody else on the panel would also want to respond before you make that question. Can I, can I clarify the question then? I mean, so I get it answered, can I clarify it? Okay, go ahead. So, I mean, if, if I'm looking at the information properly, there's a report of abuse, there's some type of investigation, and then within a year, many of the children that die as a result of homicide are dead. What conclusion should we draw from those facts? 
I think if I could correct you a bit, it's partly in your understanding or your characterization of your understanding of the data. So the history of defects, what we need to remember is in that case definition, which is mandated by our state law, includes a whole span of interventions. So the nature of a call when it comes in, let's say we, we have the benefit of hindsight in a particular instance where a child has died, and we put that in the category of the homicide, but in reality what that may look like when it first comes to the attention of the department may be a call about uh, the child seems underfed, or the child is misbehaving at school, or the parents, and, uh, the parents are divorcing and there's a contested custody action. Something that doesn't necessarily give you some causal link to what ultimately was the outcome that we wish we could have prevented. So that's firstly, uh, and I think that's important. The other part is that you said that your understanding is that once that contact is made, an investigation ensues. Investigation is not necessarily the response of the agency, depending on the nature of the actual report. So as I describe that, all those possible scenarios, depending on the seriousness and the urgency of the allegations that are reported to the agency, determines how the agency will respond. So on some of those cases, for example, a contested custody kind of allegation, the parents are fighting, child's caught in between, he's distracted in school, that's not going to give rise to an investigation. That's not a situation where abuse or neglect is being alleged. So that can actually, that scenario can end up in this report. And it would tell us nothing from that initial report, nor the response from the agency, that we were at risk for a homicide at the end of the day. So that's just one example. But this is the problem that I, and the reason I asked for comment, is because I want to go back to this. This is what we want to do. We want to draw causal connections from this. That's what our appetite is about, because we all feel the urgency around preventing these deaths. And we see the opportunity, we think we perceive an opportunity that when the agency is involved, that we could prevent these deaths. But in reality, those case definitions are so broad, there's so much variation in the way that a case comes to the attention to the department and the reasons for that case coming to the attention of the department, as well as in the range of responses from the department, that we really can't, it would be erroneous to draw those kinds of causal connections. Uh, to speak kind of in the national frame too, this is not an experience that's unique to Georgia. Uh, again, I would commend the department, and I don't want to chill the, the interest of the department in pursuing better data integrity and doing more public disclosure. We compare very favorably to other states in doing what we're doing here today. And in reality, almost all states are reporting an increase in their child maltreatment-related fatalities, however they're defined. And in some states, they're defined by an open case. In some states, they're defined by history within one year or three years. For us, it's five, as we've discussed. Every state's reporting an increase. That may not actually be an actual increase in the incidence of fatalities. Most states are attributing that to better data collection, better collaboration among and between agencies, much like you've seen sort of represented here, um, and better reporting, as well as the kind of interest of communities and at the national level that, again, this exercise represents. The reason we're here today is because of the interest of the community. So be careful, I think, um, in two things, drawing any causal connections and to being sort of overly critical in the, what we're disclosing here. Because in reality, I think it's all in a very positive direction by way of getting a much clearer understanding of the actual problem of child maltreatment-related fatalities. And then once we have that clearer understanding, we'll be able to sort of assess that um, for what it's worth. Okay, thank you. Um, I was putting these two questions together, and lo and behold, they're from the same person. Uh, Bridget Bradley, where are you? Okay. Uh, so both of these are questions about infants, and um, one of them, 58% of deaths of infants, um, uh, the, and those listed as natural causes. Are we compiling data on mothers' past history with defects, um, care of the fetus? Are we looking at um, substance abuse? Um, and is, the, is it possible that the number under 12 months is high because they are unable to verbalize the issues uh, with the social worker, uh, et cetera? So really just a, a, a little more elaboration about the deaths of very young children. And who would like to take that? I, mean, I just want to make one comment, and that is if you look at the statistics and the information that we have, and I think that um, Commissioner Fitzgerald already touched on this, a lot of the infant deaths are a result of medical conditions and premature births or congenital conditions. And so those deaths are ones that may, in fact, not be, well, the premature might be preventable, but some of the congenital conditions may not be preventable. I'm going to pass along for any other comments. <coughs> Thank you. 
Uh, and the number was 48. I'm sorry, I may have misspoken. It's 48% of the deaths that we, look, we looked in today have to do with babies who are under uh, one year of age. Uh, in Georgia, as a matter of fact, we have been looking at our total uh, infant mortality rate, not just, not just in this population, but our entire population, and we've actually made an improvement. The number one causes are um, prematurity. It's the number one cause throughout. Uh, the second cause uh, has to do um, with congenital abnormalities that are incompatible with life. Um, and we looked at um, a much different, and, and, and we did not do, I have not done that for this particular subset. Uh, we certainly could. We have looked at the infant mortality throughout the state, and this is how we've done it. We looked at, on um, the mother's birth record, we divided the state into mile square grids. So we know exactly where that mother lives, where that infant mortality death under one year is occurring. Uh, and then, and there are differences in, for example, there are certain areas in the state that have a very high infant mortality rate. We know some reasons, like for example, there's a lot of infant mortality on the west of the state. And when we look at those areas, those are also the areas that have no obstetricians. So we think that there's a really a high infant mortality rate in those places because of lack of access to services. In other places like, for example, in Valdosta, we looked at theirs was a, a very high rate that had to do with prematurity. So we are meeting directly with those local communities, with the OBs, with the pediatricians, uh, doing active um, case management work with the public health, doing joint public-private stuff. Uh, like we look, for example, also uh, in Albany, uh, and there's a public-private partnership between the health department and between the uh, delivery, the OBGYNs in that area. And in that situation, the prenatal care is occurring in the health department. So each prenatal visit is an hour. And during that hour, they talk about, I mean, there's a community support system, it's a group meeting. They talk about prematurity, they talk about breastfeeding, they talk about uh, violence at home. So in that supportive situation, in that area, the infant mortality rate is 17 in our grid system. And when they did that model with the active social support of the public health department, they reduced it, I, it's off the top of my head, so this may be a little off, but I think it was down to seven. Uh, and they reduced it significantly for the persons that were asking about uh, racial differences, uh, significantly in both black and white patients. Um, so. Your, your question is, is it possible that there's social factors that are important? Absolutely. And how you can address them is a public-private partnership where you get a really supportive network around those women. follow up with a, a question that actually comes from a previous questioner, but it's relevant here and reflects something you said. It's really addressed to uh, uh, Vernon Keenan. Uh, what can we do to mandate that a crime scene is established at all child fatality locations? Now crime scenes are not established. Um, I don't know what these other references are, but can you respond to that? <laughs> I don't know that uh, I don't really need a legal mandate to do this. The secret is to have law enforcement trained in doing its job. Uh, when, and you know, in many cases, 
when a child dies, there is no evidence, there is no reason to believe that it is uh, it's been caused by criminal nature. Uh, many of these deaths are, are natural. Uh, but the secret here is to have law enforcement and the prosecutors stepping up and doing the appropriate level of investigation, working uh, with the medical examiner and determining what needs to be done. Now, the law already requires that all child deaths be reported to the medical examiner, either to the state medical examiner or the regional medical examiner. When those reports are made, a determination is made based on circumstances as to whether an autopsy is required or needed. If there's any doubt, then they go, an autopsy does go forward. Uh, but, you know, it, this is all dependent upon everyone doing their job local law enforcement, the coroner, the medical examiner, the prosecutor, and social services providing information. So how can you determine natural causes or a reason for death if there's no autopsy and there's no crime scene? Well, the, well it, you know, if a child has, medical, has a medical history and dies in the care of a physician, then it's not necessary, it's not absolute necessary that an autopsy be done. Mm -hmm. So this is more about a process question as well, and it's for Ashley Wilcott. Does the Department of the Child Advocate review each county defects office to see how cases are handled um, on a regular basis, regardless of child deaths, etc.? Is it possible to get this other? <laughs> um, I don't mind handing it to the next person. Uh, no, do we review county offices? No, not unless the referral is made. We can and have the authority to audit local county offices, and if there is merit, a referral is made that we deem that's appropriate, we absolutely do it. We have found that, truthfully, there are some counties in which we hear of more cases, and we see that there may be a systemic issue with that particular office, and we address it with that local office. So yes, we can audit. Do we do it naturally? No, it's based on referrals we receive. Judge's accountability, that's an excellent question. Um, if we receive a referral in which that becomes part of the equation, we reach out. We have the authority to do that, we do that, and look to the accountability of judges. Um, other than that, we don't specifically look at it. But there is a Judicial Qualifications Committee, so I would just remind everyone of that resource. Okay, we're going to move to um, some of the specific kinds of um, uh, deaths and, and maybe more information behind it. And this comes from Stephanie Blank, who chairs our Child Welfare Reform Council. Um, and there's five of them on here, so I don't think we're going to ask them all, Stephanie, but uh, with Reform Council. Um, and there's five of them on here, so I don't think we're going to ask them all, Stephanie, but uh, we'll start with a couple. Um, for accidental deaths, what percent of motor vehicle deaths involve lack of proper seat restraints? Uh, what percent of drownings involve neglect and lack of supervision? Um, I, I guess in general we could ask for these these uh, accidents. Uh, is there further into investigation into the possibility of neglect or lack of supervision? And um, could I respond just at least for a piece of it? So the first lady's cabinet has looked specifically at drowning deaths, and so. OCA pulled statistics for the last, uh, since May, and there were 10 water-related deaths, and we were able to drill down on that and say, where did they occur? Was lack of supervision an issue? And in the majority of those cases, it was either, in nine of the cases, I can tell you specifically, for instance, um, nine of those occurred either in a private pond on the owner's property or in a private pool. Only one of the cases involved any intoxication or any other reason that they said a parent or caretaker was incapacitated. All of those cases, there was more than one adult present. So I think that you can argue clearly there's a lack of supervision in those nine cases, but did it rise to the level of neglect? That's a hard thing to say. Unfortunately, um, I, I would submit there are tragic accidents, and yes, for five, you know, it can happen in a minute, someone wasn't watching closely enough. In one of those 10 deaths, it was a community pool, many adults, lifeguards, et cetera, and the child did pass away. So 
Um, I would just submit that certainly data, my point is, certainly all of those things can be drilled down on and you can really look. The problem is, again, how do you define these things? You can't really draw conclusions or say there's a nexus or a causal relationship because of some of uh, somewhere you end up after you look at the specifics. What about the car seat? I don't know about the car seat. The best resource for things like that might actually be the Child Fatality Review Report that comes out annually. I have a copy in that folder. You're welcome to dig through it from 2012 because they really look at more, more of those sort of public health issues and do the more granular level of detail based on the death score, the general child population, as opposed to, you know, the lens here is very much about agency intervention with a certain subset of those kids that ultimately were deceased. So I would just, I'm not prepared to tell you those answers, but I can tell you that I think that's a really good resource that might have more of that detail that you're interested in. Do you have enough car seats? Rickman, um, National Forum for, National Youth Advocate Program Board. Um, uh, and I think I'll direct this one to Director Cagle because it was referenced in the, um, um, slide presentation, what are the ethical implications for practitioners of applying predictive models um, in the realm of child abuse and neglect? What happens to privacy or presumption of innocence? Um, I can't read the rest, but you get the gist of it. That's a, that's a great question. Part of what we're looking at here um, is when you use predictive analytics. Um, so, to use predictive analytics to pick families prior to any kind of report of abuse or neglect clearly would be outside the bounds of what we're trying to do. Um, these cases where we're trying to determine if there's a predictive model are ones that would have come to our attention by way of a, a report of abuse or neglect. And if we use that data to better inform the social worker as they go out so that they can inquire further. Uh, and be sensitive to factors that may be at the heart of the death of the child. Any follow-up? Um, I would, I think that, yeah, I, I'm particularly concerned that every time I get something from Amazon.com that they figure me out. And so I really, because this is a public dialogue, I'm so much concerned about this issue. The concern for the children is also the concern for and the concern for the workers who are trying to do, in most cases, in good faith, the best job they can. And I worry that if we put too much burden on our statistics and our predictive analytics, we may actually disable the system. So that's not a question, but that's what was behind the question. At this point, what I would say is that if we have been capable of developing an analytics program uh, at this point that would clearly define the kids that would have an outcome such as this, I think we would have done it. Um, this cannot be a technique that is used by itself. Uh, still, the primary uh, tool in investigation of child abuse neglect claims is functional family assessments uh, and collect about the family to verify the information that they give you. So this is only a beginning place. If it's ever used as the sole source of uh, information to be able to make decisions about our family, I think we're headed in the wrong direction, even if it becomes the primary analytical factor. It needs to be one component only to prompt questions that would help us better understand the functioning of the family. This question comes from Ozia SQ with the Georgia Academy of Pediatrics. Where are you? Okay. Um, how do the panel, and I'm going to start with Carl on this one. How do the panelists see the role of a child's medical home impacting this data? And how are you as a panelist engaged with this piece of a child's life? We see our home-based services program as a component of a medical home. So when we work with a specialist, for example, at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, and the child has very complicated social issues in the home that are having an effect on the child's health and well-being, then we are an outsourced social services for that medical home that serves the child. 
So one of the things our nurse trainers do, we have nurses that will go into the home and educate, educate a family about the child's condition and provide training for anywhere from a month to six months working with the family to make sure they understand this child's care requirements. But we also accompany the parent to the appointment with the specialist to make sure the specialist can communicate to the family at their level what the child's condition is and that the family is able to take the doctor's instruction and then translate them into practical tasks in the home. So um, the concept of the program is that it is part of a medical home model. Let me add a follow-up, and um, I'll try to be very brief. I have trouble with being brief, okay? <laughs> we'll control your car. Kind of a, um, I just want to make sure people understand that, you know, we work, most of the families we work with have incomes under 100% of the federal poverty rate. So that's $24,000 a year for a family of four, I believe it is. Half, half. When we get into the home, have incomes under $10,000 a year. Many do not have primary care physicians. Many have not been able to go to a doctor's office. We have, we're working with one kid now that went for a year without physical therapy because of some complexity in getting the service put in place. In addition to that, um, when you do case management work or in-home services with the families, I think all of us live in the same place for a while. We have families. It's not uncommon that they're moving every six months. There's no landline telephone that they use disposable cell phones or a free cell phone, and they'll have the cell phone service, you know, while it's working. And so their frequent, frequent telephone number changes. Telephone can change four times in a given year. So if DFACS refers a child to us, Child Protective Services, is oftentimes it's very difficult to follow the family around to where they move. And we've had families that we've gotten started on services and suddenly they don't know where they are anymore and they could pop up in Valdosta or somewhere. I mean, we all have these assumptions about what, you know, a practice or a case manager or a social worker can actually do when there's a report of possible medical neglect or child abuse. Sometimes it's very difficult to track the family and really understand where they are or what's going on in the home. So back to the medical home model, I think it's very important for physicians working in a medical home to not try to undertake the social services aspect on their own because there are many specialty providers out there that dealing with adverse social determinants and complex situations that are bread and butter. And to try to not work in a silo but kind of work within the existing range of community services. I think we have another response from Director King. I think we'd all agree that a medical home is a definite step in the direction of better health for children and for families. Um, in our casework where we're doing investigations or even family preservation work, uh, it's very difficult for us to control that. As a matter of fact, we don't control it. That's in the control of the family. So it's really an education process for us at that point. However, when the child comes into our custody, that's a different thing. We become the parent for the 
child at that point in time for all intents and purposes. And um, we are able to then link them uh, through a new partnership with the Merit Group, uh, Georgia Families 360, uh, to a medical home. And uh, hopefully as they exit care, we will be able to uh, have educated the parent about the, the uh, benefits of the medical home and uh, have continuity there. This comes from Bert Elliott, UGA's social work school. Question is, is information on worker and supervisor education, training, and experience being collected in child fatality case reviews? If not, will this information be collected and analyzed? And uh, I also am interested in how you use what you learn in these reviews to come back into the training of, of um, even the, the uh, Child Protective Service workers in that first response. I'm looking to Martha, who's done the data analysis on this uh, at this point. Martha, um, would you yes. like to? Yes, um, OHRMD. Can you come uh, up here, Martha? Yes. <laughs> I know 100% the answer, um, but I do know that uh, we do review that as we review child death cases, and OHRMD has been involved in the review of our child death cases, and they have done that strictly for the purposes of enhancing training for frontline workers and new workers to make sure that they're getting the skills they need to do these investigations. So, quick answer, yes, we are reviewing. I don't know if it's 100%. I couldn't answer that totally, but... Yes, we do take that into consideration definitely when we are reviewing child death cases. Can you say what the acronym stands for? Um, OHRMD, OHR Office of Human Resource Development. Thank you. <laughs> Did you have a follow-up? Yes. Yeah. 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 Ye
actually this also, if substance abuse is involved, um, even prenatal exposure, how is it classified, homicide, accident? I don't know how it's classified, but I would just remind, so in these particular cases that Martha outlined today, and DFACS hasn't had any involvement in the last five years, it wouldn't have been captured in this data, but it would be captured by the Child Fatality Review that now lays with GBI. So when they do their next report, and I know they're working on the data with the experts for 2013, then that's going, all of that information is going to be specifically broken down in that report. So I would just suggest looking to that for those specific pieces of data. able to clarify that a little bit because if um, the manner and cause of death don't necessarily correlate to a finding of abuse or neglect and I think that's what your question is sort of focusing on so we may have a child who dies due to a gunshot wound and it may be classified as a homicide um, we may or may not find neglect in that situation given the circumstances around that particular gun incident um, but the cause and manner is a definition the maltreatment finding is a separate finding. Um, and then the, the final one on that. Um, um, define natural causes of a death of a child under 18. Do we consider this medical neglect? And again, that's, that's not a natural, is um, is a medical examiner, I mean, it's a coroner and a medical examiner finding medical neglect would be due to um, extenuating circumstances around any particular case. So just because a child dies due to a natural death and they have medical issues would not correlate with medical neglect. Does that, I hope that answers the question. I think that one came from um, one of our online posts. determination is not one of abuse or neglect. Right. The coroner's determination is of the cause and manner of death, so that would be classified as a natural death, um, based on my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong. And so it really would depend in that example that you gave, Stephanie, about whether that case ever was reported to DFACS, that family, excuse me, was ever reported to DFACS, and then it might be caught up in this conversation, this report that DFACS has begun doing, um, and then you have some sort of indication, textual indication about whether there might have been abuse or neglect about uh, whether there was ever abuse and neglect involved in the, in the family. But it wouldn't necessarily, again, be tied to the classification of, of the cause and manner of death. Hard for people to hear back here, and I'm not going to be able to repeat it. Um, Did you have a, that was one of my questions? But in the report, it says 76 kids. Uh, what do we assume that is? So, what are natural causes for the 76 that died? So, there are multiple examples of natural causes, and I think in some, and I don't have the report, but I believe that we have broken down some of them. Many. Any child who was born pre extremely prematurely, even if they had perhaps a substance abuse um, allegation of neglect, and this is where it gets confusing, their death is actually natural because they died due to the circumstances around their prematurity. So any child who had a medical condition that was the cause of their death would be considered a natural death. Um, I'm trying to make sure that I'm covering uh, congenital disorders. Uh, Children with cerebral palsy who have a decline in their medical condition, trisomy 18, um, leukemia, cancer, uh, all of those things would be considered a natural death. Um, we may or may not be involved because of the reason that that child dies. And so I think that it gets confusing when you're looking at defects history and type of defects history. 
We may be involved for a totally different reason and a child might die, might die to, due to a medical reason. We may be involved because another kid is not attending school. So the medical issue and the natural finding is just a manner and a cause that we're, we're categorizing based on what the coroner and medical examiner have, have determined. If there is an autopsy done, um, some, usually there is a cause and manner of death that is issued by a physician, um, and many of those are from hospitals. If a child dies in a hospital, they may or may not do an autopsy. Uh, some of those are still considered natural deaths. So we have some questions that I, I think probably expand out a little beyond just the deaths to the, the facts operations that I'm going to go ahead and ask. Um, um, and I'm going to ask them somewhat together and ask Director Cagle to respond. Um, one comes from um, Devin Feely. A recent report found caseworkers in some counties had more than 100 cases each. How can you adequately protect children with these kinds of caseloads and what's being done? Um, one is on the hotline. Please establish a 24-hour open line for physicians and ERs um, to report sus suspect, uh, suspected confirmation cases of child abuse. Voicemail answering machines are not adequate for this type of reporting. Um, and uh, then this comes from Stan Jones. Uh, DCH and DBHDD are both doing more re-medical re -medical claims data. Is anything happening to use individual medical histories to inform child welfare decisions? So I'll take the, uh, the easy one first. Uh, since October of last year, uh, DFACS has been operating a 24-hour day, 7-day a week, 365-day-a-year call center. Um, that uh, call center uh, is uh, up and running for medical professionals as well as the lay public. Uh, and uh, we are seeing actually an increased number of reports, partly, we think, due to the fact that we do have that kind of capability. With the medical claims data, as I said earlier, um, this information is not perfect. It is the best that we can do at this point in time. However, we do think that there is a great deal of possibility behind medical claims data. Uh, and uh, we do have some work going on in predictive analytics that uh, will take those things into account. Uh, I think we have a lot of opportunity. We have a lot of information that we can bring to bear on these issues. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, allowing us to refine the process to that point. Caseloads. Um, I think uh, we would all agree that 100 cases uh, is too many. Um, I was a caseworker. I was a pretty good caseworker. Um, when you get beyond a certain point, it's very, very difficult to even make the most basic contacts. So when you uh, get into excessive caseloads, you really diminish a social worker's uh, capability to do the kind of assessment that really leads to improved child safety. So uh, we would agree with that. I think Governor Deal has stepped forward even prior to my coming to this role uh, and uh, uh, proposed 525 caseworkers. The legislature responded uh, and gave those to us. We have 175 that started effective Jan July 1st. And in what I see as a rather unprecedented move, at least in the time that I have been in government, uh, the governor has also stepped forward. Uh, to provide us additional caseworkers, another, another 103 caseworkers that uh, were not previously budgeted. And that is a signal of uh, our concern for the number of cases that case managers are handling and their capability to be able to do an adequate assessment in the event that they have caseloads that are that excessive. Did anybody have a follow-up to their question that was just answered? I was just going to say that the care coordination discussion at DCH and the um, redo of the uh, core provider payment system are both going to give more data for the predictive analytics where you can look at what uh, what the history of somebody, uh, individual is that would probably be parent in the case that we're talking about. And they're interested 
interested in, and the softwares are getting better at going backwards and sort of identify things that don't happen as well as the claims that have been paid. And I know the departments are cooperating better on children and youth in, in the 40 years I've been working on some of this stuff, which I think is fabulous. But I'll try to add the medical claims discussion to the work of the task force. Or, you know, and it, it has to be when DBH and DCA are ready. We have to take the privacy issues into account. There's just an additional data source that's not population data like EPH has, um, or you know, the kind of data that DHS collects. So it, it, it just there's an opportunity that I wanted to ask. I just had a quick follow-up question on mine. Uh, do you have direct confirmation that those case numbers, case loads, have been brought down to more manageable levels? I do have a confirmation of that. Um, we monitor those case loads on a regular basis. Um, we look at these uh, both in the aggregate at the state level, but also at the individual case load levels. Um, we do this on a, uh, on a frequent basis, on a weekly basis. Uh, we're looking at this at the state level as well as having regional directors look at it regionally and county directors that are focused on this on a daily basis. We can't tell you with good confidence that these numbers uh, cases are coming down uh, and have done so dramatically uh, in, the, uh, in the recent past. Can I just comment quickly? So OCA audited three counties as a result of reports and the referral numbers of my investigators saying we think they have too many cases. So we are also exercising oversight over those to monitor and ensure that they come down. The three counties identified that we uh, moderated calls with are ones Bobby's familiar with, Commissioner Pagel, sorry, and working on. So we're also monitoring to ensure that changes happen at the OCA perspective. And those counties were Hall, Gwinnett, and? Uh, Carol, no. Give me just a minute. Which was the other one? Hall, Gwinnett, and Chuck, do you remember? Carol? Clayton. Clayton, was it? Cl no, it was Carol? Thank you, sir. Carol, my investigator's back there reminding me. I couldn't remember. Thank you. The, the other thing that I should have said earlier is that uh, the caseworker allocations of the 278 caseworkers that the governor and the legislature have provided to us have been based upon uh, the growth in caseloads in particular areas. In those areas that had these really high caseloads, we took the initial positions and added them there first because we knew that this was a problem. We knew we had to address it quickly. Uh, and uh, we, as we get these caseworkers out and train, those caseloads will come down even further. So I ordered this weather in so that you wouldn't leave early. <laughs> <laughs> and the sun's going to come out in about 15 minutes. Um, so this question is from Dr. Gordon Drapes from GAS. It's the um, and I'm going to start with Dr. Fitzgerald on this one. Um, um, has there been analysis? Uh, There's actually a very long question. I'm going to short little. Has there been analysis of drug use related to deaths of children, but also um, smoking during pregnancy and after, as secondhand smoke increases the risks of um, so can you speak to, I guess, um, both the prevention uh, and the, the way that these departments and your department in particular might work to uh, address substance abuse uh, but also smoking that would somehow contribute to a child's death? Uh, yes, we have been looking at both of those things. We've been looking at uh, we have been looking at drugs related in pregnancy, both in prescription drug uh, misuse, um, particularly pain medication misuse in pregnant patients, um, and also in, um, in non-prescription use medication. The data in Georgia indicates that there's really not been an increase in illegal drugs, but there has been a fairly significant increase in legal drugs. Um, in pregnancies, and that is of concern to us, and we are beginning uh, to 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 work with the pediatricians and to try to increase awareness um, with the Georgia Hospital Association with the pediatricians and the OBGYNs because of that issue. So yes, that is an increasing problem in Georgia. Uh, as far as looking at smoking in pregnancy, our rates are reasonable. 
Um, we do know that smoking in pregnancy is uh, is, is is very bad. I just went, um, as a matter of fact, had a public relations um, tour in that we went to um, a studio and made lots of announcements for lots of local television stations across the state. Uh, and I talked about smoking in pregnancy, and I said, you know, the one thing about smoking in pregnancy that people know is that there's um, harmful substances. There's cyanide, you know, there's carbon monoxide, there's all these bad poisonings. What people may not know is that it is a vasoconstrictor that it clamps down on the blood uh, supply to the baby. And I said, it's like, and this was radio, uh, I said, it's like putting a, a pillow over a child's face. It's really suffocation. Uh, so certainly public health is trying to, in as vivid terms as we can, uh, get out the message that not only is smoking bad, but being around secondhand smoke is especially bad for pregnant women. Any follow-up? Well, just that, uh, you know, the nicotine has a definite effect upon the brain of the child. The carbon monoxide level in the baby in the womb is much higher than the carbon monoxide level Uh, as an OBGYN, I absolutely agree with you. <laughs> Before I was public health uh, officer, I, I, I'm an OBGYN by training, so you are absolutely right. And I can tell you that public health is one of our main initiatives is to decrease smoking in pregnancy. It's a huge part of our state tobacco plan. Georgia really, ha um, as far as comparison with other states, we don't have as high a smoking rate as, as some other states. But any smoking around a pregnant woman, either by the mama or by anybody else, is just unacceptable behavior. And one study showed that uh, being obese and being a smoker at the same time, the babies increase risk with like two and a half times for congenital heart disease. So I'm going to make this the last question, and it's just uh, another indication of how when you give us data, we want more. Um, what are the provisions um, what about near fatalities? Do you monitor near fatalities and, um, uh, and the insight that can give us to preventing both deaths and harm to children? Although this report is, of course, focused on fatalities, we do also collect uh, another category called serious injuries. Uh, we look at those uh, in the same way that we look at fatalities, trying to determine <coughs> our commonalities amongst those so that we can provide uh, the kind of uh, interventions that are needed. If you're talking in terms of um, what is needed to address those things in the community, we have a lot of needs, and depending on where you're at in the city, there may be more or less opportunity for you to access those services. Um, those uh, services can range from uh, substance abuse treatment to uh, domestic violence interventions to uh, the uh, cognitive, cognitive behavioral and uh, trauma-informed therapies that we know are probably most effective with the children and families that are part of our system. I'm going to ask the panelists to take a few minutes to collect their thoughts for their 30 second, second close. And in the meantime, I want to remind you that we do this every month. And on August the 26th, we'll have another session here that will be on virtual services, uh, delivering services virtually to kids. Um, and we will have another follow-up to that that will talk more about the impact of these uh, digital and um, electronic kinds of media for kids. So uh, if you're not on our email list, please go online to georgiavoices.org and get signed up. And um, I also would like, like to recognize my board chair for being here today. John, thank you. And Denny's on my board as well. She's kind of too I don't think I have any other board members here, but we appreciate it when our board comes. 
And so with that, I think I will just this time go in the order, and then uh, <coughs> Director Kay will go last. So we want their 36-second wrap-up of either what they want from us or what they see themselves doing uh, over the next year to respond to this. So, Melissa? Sorry, it's timer. Um, so mostly, I just, I'm just impressed with the turnout here and the diversity from the perspectives that all of you represent, and I'm glad for that. I come from the advocacy community, so I want you to leave here a little agitated. Agitated about these issues, agitated in a direction toward taking action. And if you can take away, appreciate the takeaways in terms of where our high leverage points are around, not that all children don't need attention, and we need differentiated, age differentiated strategies, but our young kids and their particular vulnerabilities, and think about what, what position you have to influence that, whether in your professional or your personal domains. Um, as far as what we're doing going forward, the Barton Center is in some great, um, strong collaborations with the department to do some of this work around looking at their processes for reviewing child death and serious injury cases, for comparing that process and looking at how that works in other states, for looking at how we're going about disclosing this information and meeting those expectations for transparency as well as the ones imposed by law, um, so that we can hopefully have a model process around this that satisfies the department's needs, that satisfies your interests, and that benefits the children and families that ultimately are being served. Um, the predictive analytics is obviously cutting edge, uh, and there's some great work going on in that area, so I think we're headed in a really good direction. So um, just in my final comment would just be that I hope you can appreciate um, you know, that, that this is about transparency of the system, that this is complicated. You have a number of roles represented here. You all have your own perspectives on these issues. We have oversight bodies. We have intervention bodies. We have prevention bodies. We have every bodies. Um, and we need to all get busy. Um, but the fact is that this is complicated. And so the last thing I would want to say is to be very careful um, in our uh, desire to be critical and to do that based on false assumptions that we think we can draw some causal connection. We have an interest and appetite for that, but we're just not in a position where we can provide the information to let us draw, connect those dots in that way. Um, and so I think that's all of our responsibility as stewards of our state, of our system, and of the services that are provided to our most vulnerable children and families. Um, thank you all for coming today. I envision the OCA raising the bar and taking steps and ensuring that we all raise the bar for the protection of children in the state of Georgia. I would encourage you, this is a public agency, if you have questions, feel free to contact me directly. If there's information I can provide to you, if I cannot, I will try to steer you in the right direction. And as a referral basis, if, to share the word, pass the word. If there are cases of concern, people need to know to reach out to those yet. Ditto. <laughs> but I would like to add, um, as a provider, um, and having worked on the Child Protective Services Advisory Committee for eight years, in reviewing Child Protective Services, that um, I would hope that the media take a different approach to reviewing DFAC's operations, and if we're going to be critical, to really look at what the data says, what it doesn't say, and to get a better grasp on the underlying conditions. For example, someone asked Bobby about um, high caseload levels. Well, could anyone imagine that has anything to do with the fact between 2008 and 2010 um, in the prior uh, administration that DFACS had the largest budget cut of state funds of any state in the United States by far. The only state that was remotely close was Minnesota, I believe. So obviously that has an impact on the ability of the state to retain workforce, to have people in place, and all of these components in a very complex issue affect child fatality. Thank you. Questions that are asked here today reinforce the need for information so that appropriate decisions can be made and that appropriate policy can be made. It also reinforces the importance of the Georgia Open Records Act so that this information is made available to all of you and to the citizens of the state so that the transparency that is important to all state agencies occurs. Uh, my comments are about the questions, too. I want to appreciate the questions that I got today. They brought to mind some other ways, some other questions that we can ask with the medical data we have in public health to maybe show a little more light on this. Um, very interesting questions about the relationship 
uh, between medical condition and medical care uh, and medical compliance uh, with these issues, and we will see if we can get more to that issue. And the second question is, I want to uh, comment is, I want to once again uh, pledge that public health will do whatever it can to help improve the issue of the, of the children uh, in our state. First, thank everyone for coming today. Uh, I want to thank everyone for coming today. Uh, what I would say to you is that it would have been much easier for us as a department to release this report without this form. But the reason I asked uh, for us to do this was because I want first to be transparent with the public to the extent that we can, to let the public know the kind of work that we're doing and the kind of issues that we're facing when we go out to investigate child abuse and neglect. It also gives an opportunity for us to learn. Every question today provoked thought on my part, and that is really badly needed. So we encourage you to continue asking these questions, and we'll provide the answers to the best of our ability. If the data is lacking, it provides us an opportunity to go back and collect better data the next time. Uh, again, this is an issue that concerns us. I've spent uh, my entire career trying to assure that no child dies, as have the 6,300-odd employees of the Department of Family and Children's Services around the state of Georgia. None of us walk out in the morning and say, we want to go out and do a bad job. We all leave our homes every day committed to assuring safety for children and doing the very best that we can. That is my commitment to you, uh, and as part of that, uh, it will be a public engagement process for us from this point forward, and we welcome you to engage with us. Thank you. The sun isn't shining yet. I'm sorry. I screwed up on that one. Um, but for those of you who uh, would like to refer this to somebody else, know that this, the video for this will be online on our website uh, in about, what, three or four days, maybe? Uh, and uh, as advocates, uh, we are here to ask questions. And we thank you for being here and posing that, that whole array of questions from not only on child deaths, but to how is the department operating. And for those of you that didn't get your question asked, and there were a few, um, we will share these with the departments so that uh, if they can reach out to you because your information is on here to get an answer, we will get one later. And, uh, and thank you all for being here.